Okay, we're live. <laughs> He's scary right. for a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So glad to be back. We are getting ourselves ready to dive in. Um, I know that this is a moment a lot have been waiting for, which is to really get into this investigative judgment, this 2300 year prophecy. This is a prophecy in the Bible that a lot of times uh, is almost ignored holistically, but then there are a few movements that have different interpretations of it. But we're gonna, by the grace of God, start to make it plain tonight. And so as we get ready to get started, we have a lot to cover. Um, we wanna also ask that you all be with our dear brother, Lance. It'll be a couple of weeks before we see him again. We know that many of you have been blessed uh, having brother Lance on the line, but he's gonna be uh, out of pocket. He's well, but he's just gonna be out of pocket for the next couple of presentations, this presentation and next week, and then he'll be back after that. So Pastor Ivor, Sister Nefer, and myself, by the grace of God, will be holding it down. So let's go ahead and let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to begin. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all of your people who just are anticipating blessings. They're looking forward to hearing your voice, not merely ours, but that we might be mouthpieces that speak your words. And Lord, we pray that every hungering soul will not leave here empty, that they will feel refreshed, they will be filled, and they will have deeper understanding than what they had at the beginning of this time together. And so we avail ourselves to you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to touch each and every heart and be the chief teacher to make your truths plain. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins, and we thank you again for this privilege to serve. Bless us now as we dive into your words. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Take us away. All right. So um, we have uh, been leading up to this this moment. Uh, first of all, good good evening, everyone. We're we're glad to see you all on. Um, if you've been following, we pray that you have been blessed. Um, if this is your first time watching us, uh, all of the videos we've done so far have, are on YouTube. I think they're on Facebook as well. Uh, so if you need to catch up, just go back and look at the videos that we have done in the past. We've tried to do things um, in a particular order, uh, and we are taking our time in doing it. Okay, uh, But tonight, you're going to get a crash course on the book of Daniel. So I'm going to need you to really stay focused and uh, I'm going to juice this down for you, right? So uh, you can't really eat like, you know, 50 carrots in one setting, but if you juice those carrots, you can drink it all in one setting. That's what we're about to do with the book of Daniel, all right? So let me begin by sharing this concept. And I think we have spoken about this in a, in a previous study. The book of Daniel is written on the principle of repeat and enlarge. The prophecy that we are focusing on tonight is found in Daniel chapter 8, and particularly verse 14, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But in order for us to understand what's happening in Daniel 8, we need to have an understanding of what happens in the prophetic chapters before Daniel 8. So specifically speaking, there are two prophetic chapters before Daniel chapter eight. Those are Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter seven. In all, the prophetic chapters of the book of Daniel are Daniel two, Daniel seven, Daniel eight, Daniel nine, Daniel 11, and Daniel 12. In order to understand Daniel seven, eight, nine, 11, and 12, you must have correct understanding of Daniel 2. Daniel 2 is the foundation. So what is Daniel 2 talking about? By the way, this principle of repeat and enlarge simply reveals that Daniel 7 is a repeat and enlarge, an enlargement of what is in Daniel 2. Daniel 8 does the same thing. It goes into more detail. Daniel 9 does the same thing, more detail. Daniel 11, going into 12, is the most detailed chapter in the book of Daniel. But here's the thing. If you understand Daniel 2, you have everything you need to understand Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, right? 
So Daniel 2 is the foundation. So here we go. We're going we're gonna to take a very quick look at what's in Daniel 2. Um, and if you have your Bibles, follow along. Uh, I'm not going to take you verse by verse for the sake of time. I just want you to follow along. Um, and you can read this for yourself. You can check out as I'm speaking, okay? So we're going to Daniel 2. And in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. In that dream, he doesn't even remember what he sees. Daniel has to tell him what he saw and then interpret the dream for him. So how many of you know what Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 2? One, I'm sorry, what Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel chapter 2, what he dreamt in Daniel 2. One, if you are familiar with that vision. And I'm not even going to wait. Just go ahead and put the one. Let me go ahead and break this down. What Nebuchadnezzar saw was an image of a man whose head was of gold. His chest and, and his arms were of silver. His belly and his thighs were of brass. And the legs were of iron. Daniel goes on to explain that these different metals represented four kingdoms. Four kingdoms, okay? He doesn't say five kingdoms, doesn't say eight kingdoms, four kingdoms. After the legs of iron, Nebuchadnezzar in his dream saw toes that were of iron and clay. And then after these toes of iron and clay, a stone was cut out without hands that hit the image on its feet and destroyed the whole image. That stone represents the second coming of Jesus, okay? What Daniel proceeds to explain to Nebuchadnezzar is that these four metals, the, the, the head of gold, chest arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, represents four kingdoms. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar that Babylon is the head of gold, okay? Then he says, after Babylon, or Babylon is going to fall, and another kingdom is going to rise and take the place of Babylon. Well, historically speaking and biblically speaking, that kingdom that overthrew Babylon were the Medes and the Persians. So head of gold, Babylon. Chest and arms of silver would be the second kingdom. That would be the Medes and the Persians. Then he says another kingdom would arise that would overthrow the Medes and the Persians. Well, what kingdom was that historically speaking? I don't know, Dwayne, if you want to just give us an answer. The answer is putting you on the spot. Say that question again, sir. Man, <laughs> that third kingdom out, and never you better be on guard because I'm coming to you next. That third kingdom that overthrew Medo Persia was the kingdom of. Greece. Greece. Very good. And the last kingdom, the fourth kingdom, Sister Nefer, was the kingdom of? You were muted. No. <laughs> Rome. Very good. All right, guys. So we, we need to follow this very carefully because I'm going somewhere with this. Mm -hmm. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. What is the kingdom in which, which kingdom was it that persecuted Jesus? That put like Jesus to death. Tonight. I hope y'all came awake tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to focus on this, guys. Mm -hmm. the, the king that put Jesus to death is the Roman Empire. So it wouldn't be the head of gold, nor the chest and arms of silver, nor the belly and thighs of brass, but the legs of iron put Jesus to death. Okay? Now, after the kingdom of Rome, after the, uh, the pagan Roman Empire, the Bible tells us that 10 kingdoms or 10 powers would rise within the Roman Empire. Hmm. This is what happened to Rome. When Rome fell, um, it was not overthrown from outside forces, but it, di it divided into various kingdoms and nations. But the Bible still considers it Rome. There's only how many kingdoms? Four kingdoms, right? So you have Rome, and then we might say Rome divided. Those were the mm -hmm. toes, these 10 kingdoms that came out of Rome. But according to the vision, it's still Rome. The last thing 
Daniel reveals of this vision is that there is this element of clay that rises up within the 10 toes. This is significant because clay is different from all these other metals. Mm -hmm. If you look in the Bible, you will see that clay is symbolic of a professed people of God. You are the potter, we're the clay. Check out Isaiah 64, verse 8. Other verses that verify this. God calls himself the potter and his people are the clay. So what you have happening in Daniel 2 is this rising up of a power that claims to be of God, but is mingled or mixing with the Roman Empire. All right? So one, if you follow what I've said so far, we're pretty much done with Daniel 2. See? It wasn't that hard, guys, was it? V very simple, right? Head of gold, Babylon, chest and arms of silver, Medo Persia, belly and thighs of brass, Greece, legs of iron, Rome. The toes of iron, still Rome, but divided. The clay that comes up among the, the iron toes, a religious element that rises within Rome. This is all happening in Rome, guys. So here's what I want you to catch. God is using different symbols, but it's all under the umbrella of Rome in that fourth kingdom. Okay, very good. Daniel 2, down. If you remember this, guys, you have mastered Daniel 2. How do you feel about yourselves? All right, hopefully you feel good. Now let's go to Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, um, I want you to check this out because Daniel 7 is simply a repeat and enlarge, enlargement of Daniel chapter 2. Okay, so, so what's happening in Daniel 7? If you go to Daniel 7, you will see there that now Daniel has a dream. And in this dream, he sees four beasts. Four beasts. The first is a lion. The second is a bear. The third is a leopard that has four heads. And the fourth is this beast with iron teeth. Now I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna give you a pop quiz here. I haven't told you what these beasts are. But in Daniel chapter seven, Daniel tells us that these four beasts represent four kingdoms. So I'm gonna ask you a question, guys. I haven't said anything. I just wanna ask you, who would the lion be in Daniel chapter seven? Remember now the principle of repeat and enlarge. Nothing new in Daniel seven, it's a repeat of Daniel two. So who is the lion in Daniel seven? The lion would represent what kingdom? I'm looking for your answers. So the lion would represent, very good. The first person I see to say it, I'm just gonna keep moving. Babylon, very good. The bear, the second beast, this bear overthrows the lion. What kingdom would that represent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Uh, you, you're jumping a little ahead, Kay. Remember, that's right. Luis, no Persia. The Medes and the Persians. That's the kingdom of the bear. The, the next beast, the leopard, has four heads and overthrows the bear. What kingdom would that, is that going to represent? All right. That is a kingdom of Greece. Now, here's the significance of the four heads of this leopard. When Alexander the Great overthrew the Medes and the Persians, he, he died shortly thereafter, and his kingdom was divided into four kingdoms. Those kingdoms were led out by the generals Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, and Lysimachus. So four generals. And that's why the Bible describes this beast as having four heads. So we're simply getting more detail. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let me pause for a second. We're not told why in Daniel 2 this, this stone cut out without hands, which represents Christ, why does it hit the image on the feet? We're not told. All we know 
is that it doesn't hit the image in the head. It doesn't hit it in the chest and arms. It doesn't hit it in the in the in the uh, belly and thighs of brass. It doesn't even hit it in the legs. It hits it in the iron and clay. So is it fair to, to say then that there is something about that mixture of iron and clay that brings about the second coming of Jesus? That is so offensive to God that he says, now is the time to come. Yes. Yeah, the answer is yeah. There's something about this iron and clay, this mingling of, of something that appears to be Christian, but yet is mingling with the world around it. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it's not in a good way. Okay. By the way, this is a pop quiz. Does this mingling happen before the first coming of Jesus or after the first coming of Jesus? One, if your answer is before. Two, is if it is after the first coming of Jesus. I I'm leading you up to something here. So this, this, the toes of iron and clay mingling, does it happen before the first coming of Jesus or after? It happens after. We all got to be on the same page with this, guys. It happens after. There is no way it can happen before because we know that Christ is crucified in the part where it's the legs of iron. He's not even on earth when the toes and eye of iron and clay come on the scene. So this is after Christ. All right. Why do I bring that up? Because in Daniel 7, we have a repeat and enlarge. But now we begin to get more information about this clay element. God is trying to give us more detail. So in Daniel 7, we now see the, the, the lion, Babylon, the bear, Medo-Persia, the leopard, Greece. And then we see this fourth beast that has great iron teeth. What is that going to parallel? That's going to parallel the legs of iron. See that? Legs of iron is the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2. This fourth beast in Daniel 7 has great iron teeth. Mm. Now, after this fourth beast, I'm, I shouldn't even say after. The Bible says as John is as Daniel is beholding this fourth beast, this beast now has 10 horns. What are the 10 horns going to parallel in Daniel 2? Feet of iron and clay. The, the 10 toes, right? But watch this, guys. After, the, after these 10 horns, Daniel then says, I saw a little horn rising up among the 10 horns. Remember, just as the clay rolls up among the 10 toes, so the little horn rises up among the 10 horns. So the clay is the same thing as the little horn in Daniel 7. One, if you guys are following me so far. Trust me, guys, we're getting to Daniel 8. We're almost there. I'm just setting you up to see something that you will not be able to unsee. Now, here's my question for you. The little horn, what kingdom is it a part of? What kingdom number one, kingdom number two, number three, or number four? Uh-oh. It's part of Rome. Very good. So this little horn... This little horn is a Roman horn. Uh, do we all see that? Now, does the little horn come on the scene before Jesus' first coming or after Jesus' first coming? I guess there's a delay because the answers are coming in slow. Or maybe y'all are like really, really thinking hard, which is fine too. Does this little horn rise before the first coming of Jesus or after his death, burial, and resurrection? The answer is after. Why? 
Remember, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the fourth beast is Rome. This is the kingdom that killed Christ. The ten horns come after the fall of Rome. Rome as we knew it, Rome and pagan Rome. It comes after the fall of pagan Rome, but these kingdoms are still Rome. The little horn rises up among these 10 horns, which means that the little horn definitely rises after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, very good, guys. You guys are doing excellent. Now we're going to go to Daniel 8, all right? Daniel 8 is the chapter we're trying to get to. So in Daniel 8, we now see something. And I'm going to show you a chart here right after this, okay? So if you're thinking, Pastor, why are you not going to your screen or using verses? I'm trying to juice this down, and I'm going to show it to you in chart form so you can really see this picture. But I need you to see it here first before you see it on the screen. Seeing it on the screen makes it easy. I want you to think, and then I'm going to show you on the screen. Okay. In Daniel 8, Daniel now sees a vision in which he sees a ram and then a he-goat. These are the only two beasts that he sees. Now, this is strange because in the other chapters, there are four, right? But now he sees a ram and a he-goat. And when you look at what an angel comes to Daniel and tells him, let me explain to you this vision. The ram, he says, represents the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. In fact, the ram has two horns. One horn is higher than the other, representing the fact that the Medes and Persians came together. One was higher than the other. So the ram represents the Medes and the Persians. Why? Why has Daniel left out Babylon? The answer is because Babylon is about to fall off the scene. Right? So the focus is no longer Babylon, but God is still trying to show us about this little horn. In fact, if you go back with me in Daniel 7 and read about this little horn, the Bible says of this little horn that he would think, Daniel 7 25, he will speak great words against the Most High and uh, persecute the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. So what God is doing here is he's showing you, listen, the reason why I destroy this power, you're now getting a little bit better understanding. This little horn is going to think to persecute my people, even though it professes to be my people. It claims to be clay. You are the potter, you're the clay. But yet this very power, which rises out of Rome, therefore it is part of the Roman kingdom, is going to seek to persecute my people, to change my laws, and to speak blasphemous words against God himself. And this happens after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. After Rome, as we know it, pagan Rome has fallen off the scene and has divided into these smaller kingdoms. All right, now let's get to Daniel 8. In Daniel 8, we just discovered Daniel sees a ram and a he goat. The ram represents the Medes and the Persians. Here's my question for you Who would the he goat who overthrows the ram, who would that he goat represent? So remember, Babylon has fallen off the scene. We now have, a, by the way, let me just read to you the description of this he-goat for a second, okay? In fact, I'm, I'm going to do this. Dwayne, do you think you can pull that up for me? Pull what up? The, the, who the he-goat represents? No, just I just want you to read the description of this he-goat. What happens, yeah, the he-goat has something on its head, and then after that thing is broken, something comes up in its face. So go ahead. All right, so we're in Daniel 8. And I believe it's verse 21, the verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. No, 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 no. (laughs) All right. You gave it away, but that's cool. That's cool. I was talking about the description. (laughs) So 
you know, the rough goat comes from the comes from uh, flies across the face of the earth. It has a notable horn. Yeah. And the Bible says when this horn is broken, four horns, four mm -hmm. horns come up in its place. What kingdom must this ram represent? A goat. Yeah, this. I'm sorry. Must this goat represent? Y'all already getting it. You already said you were getting it before I went into that whole explanation. But I just wanted you wanted you to see how clear this is. That goat must represent Greece. Now, guys, follow this carefully, because in Daniel eight, um, let's see here. So in Daniel eight. Right after this, this, these four horns come up, the Bible says in Daniel 8 and verse, verse 9, it says, therefore, the he goat waxed very great, all right? And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. So um, here's what I want you to notice. This little horn, okay, this little horn in Daniel 8, if the Bible works on the principle of repeat and enlarge, the little horn of Daniel 8 is going to be the very same little horn of Daniel 7. All right, do you all catch that? Before we move on, I want to make sure that, that you catch, you understand what I'm saying here. Oh, boy, give me one second, guys. My screen is kind of going haywire here. I just want to take this moment to say we told I told you like in the description for our videos we always encourage you guys to bring your Bibles so I hope that you're following along um, so that you can see for yourself what it is the okay. pastor is pointing out to, to us if you don't have your okay. Bible please go get it while he's doing what he's doing please go get it so I'm about to share my screen but but I'm gonna let me share this first so I want you to notice this. In, in Daniel 8 and verse 4, by the way, talking about the little horn, the Bible uses the same symbol in Daniel 8 as it does in Daniel 7. It's this same little horn. This little horn rises after the kingdom of Greece. It is not part of the kingdom of Greece. It rises after the kingdom of Greece. So when the Bible says these four horns came out of Greece and they went towards the four winds of heaven, north, south, east, west. And then it says out of one of these directions comes forth this little horn. So the little horn is not coming out of one of these horns as if it came out of Greece. No, the little horn is coming from one of these four directions. It is the same little horn as Daniel. That's why God uses the very same symbol. So my question is, what kingdom comes after Greece? We already know this. What kingdom comes after Greece? It is the kingdom of Rome. It is the kingdom of Rome. Right? Very simple, guys. It's the kingdom of Rome. Now listen to this. In Daniel 8 verse 4, the Bible describes the ram, right? And, and it says, uh, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. He did according to his will and became great. So what does it mean that the ram became great? If the ram became great, that signifies that the ram was powerful, right? Now, when you read about the, the uh, he goat, I'm sorry, let me go back. That's the he goat. 
when you read about the ram in Daniel 8 and verse 8, it says, therefore, the he-goat uh, waxed very great. So the ram was great, but the he-goat is greater than the ram. Let me explain. Let me share with you why I'm explaining this. If the ram or the 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 ram was great, but the he goat is greater. This simple is very simple. The he goat was greater in power than the ram. Very simple, right? Now watch this. Many people teach that this little horn, Daniel 8, is Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you know who Antiochus Epiphanes is? One if you do, two if you do not. One if you know who Antiochus Epiphanes is, you kind of know who he is, two if you don't. Okay, watch this, guys. The little horn that comes after the he goat that was very great. I want you to notice, so I see a bunch of you putting twos, okay? How many of you know, have heard about Babylon? You've heard about Medo Persia. Watch this. Daniel 8, notice how it describes this little horn in verse 9. Out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great. Here's my question for you guys. If Medo, if, if Medo Persia was great, but Greece was greater, very great, and then this little horn that rises after is exceeding great, you would expect that whoever this little horn is must have been a kingdom more powerful than the Medes, than Alexander the Great, and then, and then Greece. Make sense? My question for you is this, very simple. Was Alexander the, I'm sorry, was Antiochus Epiphanes greater than Alexander the Great? Because I know y'all are all heard of Alexander the Great. No, 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 no. If this little horn is the same as the little horn of Daniel 7, then it's a greater kingdom. And we know that Rome was greater than the Grecian Empire and than the Medo-Persian Empire. In fact, if you look up that word exceeding, you will see in Daniel 7 that the fourth beast is described as exceeding great. It, it uses that word exceeding twice in reference to the fourth kingdom, which is Rome. Okay. Um, we're still building up to this, guys. We're about to wrap this up, but I'm, I'm leading you to a point that is absolutely crucial to understand. I know, I know I'm taking my time, but I need you to catch this and I need you to catch it carefully. <clears throat> In Daniel 8, this little horn is described as doing several things. Let's read it. Daniel 8, verse 10. It wax great even to the host of heaven, and it cast on some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the, tr the truth to the ground, and it practiced and it prospered. Now, the Bible tells us here that this little horn attacks something called the sanctuary. Now, I'm gonna need y'all to follow me on this, <laughs> all right? And then Nefer, I'm, I'm coming to you. You're gonna take it over uh, um, one, once we clip, finish this up. <clears throat> this little horn, Daniel 8, is the same little horn of Daniel 7. Amen? Because we know that because the Bible is operating on this principle of repeat and enlarge. This little horn, Daniel 8, is the same horn as Daniel 7, is the clay and iron of Daniel 2. Does the little horn in Daniel 8 exist before? Let me ask it this way. 
in Daniel 2, the iron, there's only four kingdoms, right? The fourth kingdom is Rome, but it uses different symbols, the legs of iron, the iron and clay. In Daniel 7, the same thing, great beast, horns, uh, 10 horns, little horn. In Daniel 8, you have two phases of Rome. One that is the first stage, pagan Rome, and then the other that is the last stage of Rome, which is that little horn. But God is using one symbol to describe this mixing of pagan Rome and this Christian element within Rome. All right. If this power is attacking a sanctuary, what sanctuary is he attacking? If it's pagan Rome, what sanctuary is being attacked? What sanctuary was destroyed by pagan Rome? When was a sanctuary destroyed by pagan Rome? Very good, guys. The destruction of Jerusalem. Pagan Rome destroyed. This is what we see so far. Whatever the sanctuary is, it is during the kingdom of Rome. It cannot be during the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians because by this time, the Medes and the Persians have fallen off the scene, which means it cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes. That's number one. Number two, if this, this little horn also represents a kingdom coming after the fall of pagan Rome, the sanctuary being attacked cannot be an earthly temple. Did you all catch that? Whatever the sanctuary that is being attacked after the death, burial, and resur resurrection of Christ, after the fall of pagan Rome, cannot be an earthly temple because there was no earthly temple. It had been destroyed by pagan Rome. This signifies, beloved, that the little horn must be attacking something in the heavens, must not want God's people to understand something about Christ's work as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Yes, yes, yes. This leads up to Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Let me read it for you. Right after this is described, Daniel then hears his words. He said, then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint would speak. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. All right. This is the last thing I'm going to share on this. The angel, Daniel overhears two angels speaking, and he's enraptured about this little horn. And he asks the question, how long is this vision going to last? That's what he asks. How long is this vision going to last? What vision? The vision of the ram, and then the he goat, and then the little horn. The answer comes back 2,300 days. Now I'm going to demonstrate to you that this, this 2,300 days cannot be 2,300 literal days. And it's for one very simple reason. If this vision encompasses the reign of Medo-Persia and then the reign of Greece and then the reign of Rome and then the reign of the, of the little horn, 2,300 days does not cover that. It doesn't even cover one of those kingdoms. Therefore, this 2,300 days must represent years since they cover the Medes and the Persians, the Grecians, the Roman Empire, and then this kingdom that rises after Rome. Yep. I'm finished. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Amen. It looks like you had something to say. I'll let you go ahead and if you wanted to add something to that. Oh, no, it's fine. I, you know, I got I got plenty to share. So go right ahead, sister. I yield. OK, I mean, well, like I said, I hope you guys have your Bibles because um, what sister. he just did, what Pastor just go ahead, go ahead, Pastor. Let, let me I never shared my screen. Let me show it to them real quick. Just a glance. Um, let me just pull this up very quickly here. Uh, OK. Can you all see that? Okay. Can you all see that? Yeah. Yes. So Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8. We have four kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. In Daniel 2, they are the head of gold, chest knobs of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, along with the toes of iron and clay. That's the fourth kingdom. In Daniel 7, Different symbols, same powers. Lion, bear, four-headed leopard, iron-toothed beast with 10 horns, and the little horn rising among the 10. And in Daniel 8, we now have the ram, the he-goat, and now the little horn is symbolizing this whole thing. Rome, pagan Rome, and what we know as papal Rome. The Roman, Roman. Catholic system, the papacy. So you see it in the chart before you, that gives you the visual. And now we know the question of when with this sanctuary being cleansed must be pertaining to something that happens thousands of years in the future from the reign of the Medes and the Persians, and even from the reign of the Roman empire. And the question becomes, when is that time? How do we figure out that time? So I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing and go ahead, Sister Never. People say they want more slides, Pastor. <laughs> um, I just um, I, what what Pastor Myers just did was um, give us a review of a lot of what we've been covering, um, taking our time and going into detail. So if this is the first time you're joining us. Like he said in the beginning, please feel free to go back to some of those other videos. Um, but we've kind of been leading to a point, and this is <laughs> part one of the point we've been leading to. Uh, so I would just want to point everybody's attention briefly to the end of Daniel chapter 8. Um, I'll start with verse 24, uh, picking up where Pastor Myers left off. It says, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. That phrase broken without hand should remind you of Daniel chapter two, where it said that there was a rock that came, um, that was formed without the hands of a man. Um, verse 26, and the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true, wherefore shut out of the vision, for it shall be for many days. And this is the point, the focal point um, that I wanted to bring everyone's attention to, and that is verse 27, where it says, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So something that we've kind of hinted at, I, I'm no brother, let me touch on it earlier, and that is, this is a very, very important subject. Um, this is something that the vision is given to him, but it's it's covering such a long period of time. And it's so important to him, and it's so traumatic even, that he becomes sick and he faints. And he's trying to understand, because he just saw the people of God, it says in verse 24, the holy people would be destroyed by whatever this power was. And we've already gone through the detail explaining why we um, come to the conclusion that the scripture is referring to um, the Roman Catholic Church of the Papacy um, in these visions, right? So, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that this is something that is so important that Daniel the prophet, who has seen so many things, gets sick to his stomach at seeing this vision and then pleads with the Lord to show him what it means. So that tells us two things. 
It tells us one, obviously, as I stated, that is extremely important, but two, that we should also be focusing on what the Lord revealed to Daniel in this vision. This is something that is put in scripture for a very specific purpose. And as Pastor Myers mentioned before, the sanctuary being um, uh, trampled with and messed with is the enemy's attack on the sanctuary. Is his specific intent to discourage us from looking into these things. And so a lot of times we hear uh, different teachers and preachers will say, well, nobody can understand the book of Daniel or they give interpretations that, for example, um, Pastor Meyer is showing how it couldn't be Antiochus Epiphanes. They give interpretations that are inconsistent with what, what scripture is saying. And so then it goes through this basically um, begging and pleading time of asking God to reveal to him what this means. He sits with some if he can't understand it. And then in chapter nine, we see that the Lord answer his, answers his prayer. Um, and the angel Gabriel comes to him. And in verse 20, verse 21, it says of chapter nine, it says, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, who I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. And so he goes into, and I'm going to allow um, Evangelist Lemon to break down the rest of this, but he goes into explaining these things to Daniel. And so again, I just really want to emphasize, guys, that for one, um, these things Daniel didn't understand without the assistance of God himself without the Holy Spirit is sending an angel to literally speak to him and bring it down. But it's been recorded for us, for us to study and to pay attention to because um, we are nearing the time of when that rock, which is formed without the hands of a man, is going to strike in the feet of iron and clay. And so this is written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so we ought to really, really be paying attention. Um, I just really wanted to emphasize that, guys. Amen. Amen. I much appreciate it, sis. And, you know, when we when we bring out these points as far as the little horn power and how it is trying to attack the sanctuary, somebody may ask, like, why? Why? Why does the devil want to attack the sanctuary? It, you know, what what makes that the target point? It's actually very simple. You know, if there are two things that I could put together, I would say it this way. Lies equals bondage, truth equals freedom. Listen listen to what I just said there. Lies equals bondage, truth equals freedom. Jesus said in John uh, chapter eight, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? And you will remember the way sin came into our world, it came through lies. It came through the devil misquoting God, misrepresenting God in Genesis three, and by Eve buying into the lie, sin was birthed in our world. So lies equals bondage. Um, and the reason I use the word bondage is because in John 8, after Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, verse 32, verse 33, they said, well, we're Abraham's seed and we've never been in bondage to any man. And then Jesus said, whosoever commits sin, verse 34, whosoever commits sin is the bondman to sin, the slave of sin, the servant of sin. So again, Lies equals bondage, truth equals freedom. That's why in Daniel 8, what was it that the Bible says that the little horn power wanted to cast down? It says it wanted to cast down the truth. You get that? That's why the devil wants to attack the sanctuary because every truth in the scripture is in the sanctuary. I don't know if you ever looked at that. An example, the Bible says, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth right? John 17, 17. The manna is not just representative of Christ, but it's also representative of his word. So the manna is in the sanctuary. Then the Bible also says, thy law is truth, Psalm 119, 142. And here it is that once again, the law of God is in the sanctuary. And then you, of course, got Jesus himself who says, I am the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. In Psalm 77 and verse 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Everything that leads to the highest degree of freedom that heaven can give humanity is found in the sanctuary. 
And so what the devil wants to do is cast down that thing and tear it apart. Because the more he can keep us away from all of what the sanctuary entails, the truths of God's word that enables us to be made free indeed, then the best way for him to keep us from that is by tearing down, misrepresenting, and ultimately trying to cast away the sanctuary. And so this is the reason why when we go through this, when Daniel saw that the little horn power was doing all of this, go to Daniel 9 and verse 16. Look at the language that Daniel used when he was praying and asking God for mercy as he saw that his people you know, were being trampled upon and, and the host is being trampled upon and so on and persecuted. Here it is in Daniel 9 and verse 16. Here's what it says. Daniel said this, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. It was not an accident that Daniel used that term became a reproach because I want to show you this real quick. Um, where are we? Let me just pull up my slides. I'm going to walk you guys through quite a bit of slides. So, you know, get ready, get ready. And all these slides will be made available to you all. But I want you to watch this. So, they love the slides. I know, right? <laughs> so, you know, Daniel used that word reproach. And you can understand because what Daniel is seeing is vision of kingdoms having dominion over God's people. All throughout Bible prophecy, you can see this truth I'm about to show you on the screen. You can see this truth being a fact. Righteousness does what to a nation? It exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. And that's why Daniel said, we have become a reproach, Lord, because of our sins. It was almost as if God saw more righteousness in Babylon than he saw amongst his own people. That's how degraded God's people can get when we turn our eyes away from him. And so it is that this is what you see over and over and over again is these other nations dominating. Think about it. When Balaam and Balak were having their conversation together and Balak said, uh, do me a favor, curse Israel, curse the people of God. I don't know if you remember what Balaam said. Balaam said, I can't. And Balak was like, why? And the answer was because they're blessed, because they were in favor with God. No nation can have exaltation over God's people when God's people are in right standing with him. But once we begin to mess around and play around and indulge in sin, we become a reproach unto God. And the other nations, because they don't know no better, you know, in their minds, they probably thinking they're doing the right thing. God can sooner identify righteousness in those nations above what he would see in his own people who knew better. And so as a result of that, often you find one nation that will dominate the next nation. So Daniel's in this deep, deep prayer of repentance. And as Sister Nefer said, what is the assurance of when we come to God in repentance? In coming to God in contrition of heart, Lord, have mercy on me. I have sinned against you. I've broken your heart. Please forgive me. What does the Bible say? I like reading this. This is just too sweet to pass by. It says in Daniel chapter 9, it was right there in verse 23. Put yourself in the place of Daniel here. It says in verse 23, at the beginning of thy supplication. It's like, imagine Daniel, he's getting on his knees and the first words that comes out of his mouth is, oh Lord. The Bible says at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Before Daniel could even say amen, Gabriel was already next to him saying, I am here to answer your prayer. And as God did, remember, the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. As God did with Daniel, he will do with every repentant heart. When we realize our sufferings are as a result of us becoming a reproach before God. We can go before the Lord in true contrition of heart, true repentance. And we can say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. I make no excuses for my sins. I recognize my faults and I simply come to you upon your grace. Have mercy upon me. Do you know by time you say amen, 
It is as if the angels of God are already next to you, ready to say, what is it that we can do for you next? For you are forgiven. And that's good news. And we get that from this beautiful prophetic story. So here it is. Daniel is pleading, Lord, I want to understand this vision. I want to make sure I get it. In Daniel 9, I want you to watch this very important word in verse 24. In Daniel 9 and verse 24, it says 70 weeks are determined. The word weeks can be interpreted sevens because there's seven days in a week. So 70 sevens, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to do three things. Finish the transgression to make an end of sins. That's all one, actually. To make to bring uh, to make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness. That's two. And to seal up the vision of prophecy and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. This is what the angel is now telling Daniel. Keep in mind, this is a very important point. There's a question that says, how much of the 2300 days would be allotted to or cut off for Daniel's people, the Jews and their capital city, Jerusalem in Daniel 9, 24? Well, where do we get this point cut off? The actual Aramaic word for determine, and this is so important to understand this prophecy of the 2300 days. What was the last? I'm actually, I'm gonna back out the screen because this one, I, I wanna see your answers here. What was the last time prophecy that was shared with Daniel before Daniel 9, 24? Let me see your comments on that. What was the last time prophecy revealed before Daniel saw what he saw in verse 24. Talk to me. What's the last time prophecy that was revealed? All right. No, no, no. The 70 weeks, Jonathan, is already the, uh, that's that's the time prophecy in Daniel 9, 24. I'm saying before that. Very good, Alric. Very good. Okay, good. We're seeing more of the right answers. The 2300 days. Very good. That was the last time prophecy. You can trace it. If you go back to Daniel 8 and verse 14, if you go to Daniel 8, 14, read verse 15 all the way to the end and then read Daniel 9 going all the way down to verse 24 and you'll see the next time frame that kicks in is this 70 weeks. So before the 70 weeks, the last prophecy revealed was the 2300 days. Now, the reason why that's important is because of, again, the word determined in verse 24 of Daniel 9. 70 weeks are determined. The word determined means cut off. So the natural question is cut off from what? And the only answer, the only answer, very good, I'm glad you got it. The only answer would be 70 weeks are cut off from the 23 hundred days. That's the only thing. So when we're studying, it is impossible to understand the 2300 day prophecy without understanding Daniel 9 and these 70 weeks. It, they're absolutely inseparable. You have to go through both because the 70 weeks is cut off from the 2300 days. Now, Pastor Ivor has already done a wonderful job in helping us understand that you know the 2300 days can't be 2300 actual evenings and mornings. It can't be that. It's just, it is impossible because we already calculated it. That thing would barely take us through one dom one kingdom. You understand? And we're going through a multiplicity of kingdoms. So there's no way that the 2300 days are literal evenings and mornings. So I'm going to show you in just a second what else it must be. But let's go ahead and let's get back to the slides. I just had to show you that part because I think that's very important for us to understand the rest of everything we're studying. So let's take a look again. So here we are. The 70 weeks were to be determined upon or cut off for the Jews. Remember, it was cut off for thy people and Jerusalem. It spelled it out specifically. OK, and it says the 70 prophetic weeks equals 490 literal years. Once we move away from the days of the week, and we, we're moving away from evenings and mornings, we now have to interpret it as prophetic or symbolic. So watch this. God's people would soon be returning from captivity in Medo-Persia, 
And God would cut off 490 years from the 2300 years and allot them to his chosen people as another opportunity to repent and serve him. These were the things that were highlighted. And these were just parallels, okay? Because finish the transgression, make an end of sin. It's, that's saying the same thing. But I want you to watch this. The, the God is telling his people that these are the things I want to see happen amongst you within this 490 years. I want you to finish the transgression and make an end of sin. Then I want you to make reconciliation for iniquity by bringing in everlasting righteousness. Then you're going to see that the vision and prophecy will be sealed up and the most holy is going to be anointed. These three things can basically be summed up as this. If you're a student of scripture, what are these three things pointing out? In that 490 years, God wanted to deal with sin, establish righteousness, and there was also judgment. Now, the reason why this is important is because we're going to break this down in just a little bit. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the reason why this is important is because if anybody's thinking right now, if you studied the New Testament before, those three words were mentioned in order. And there was only one way that these three words can come to pass in the life of people. And that was through none other than the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more and then of judgment because the prince of this world is judged none of this can be accomplished except by the Holy Spirit and so when God was telling his people Israel to make an end of sin make reconciliation and seal up the prophecy and the vision what God was letting them know is this cannot be done by might nor by power. This can only be done by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so it is with you and I. There is no way that we can fulfill the call that God makes to our lives, except it be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Never, ever try to establish righteousness. Never try to obey God. Don't even try to teach or explain his word without the aid, the guidance, the teaching, and the infilling of his Holy Spirit. So this is how God is preparing his people Israel to go through this probationary time period of 490 years. This time period was prophetic time. The reason why we know that is because again, there are times in the Bible that God says things that are not literal days, but actually they're referred to as days, but they represent years. Here's an example. The Bible says, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. You remember in Jonah 3 and verse 4, the Bible also said, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There are times that God will use wording in scripture. And there are times he will refer to days, but it also can be paralleled with years. Let me give you another example. It is in the book of Numbers chapter 14. It is in Numbers 14 right there in verse 34 that we see that days can represent years. And this is very important when we're going through Bible study. Numbers chapter 14 right there in verse 34. And the Bible says, after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. And so over and over again, there are times that the Bible will let us know that a day can equal a year. Please understand, in prophecy, a day does not always represent a year, not even in prophecy. Because Jesus said, tear down this building, and in three days, I will set it back up again. Well, that was a prophecy. He was prophesying of his death. But it was three literal days that he actually rose back up from the grave. So a day does not always 
equal a year in prophecy, but there are times that a day can equal a year. And so what we just did earlier, and Pastor Myers was leaving out, leading out on it, is he was showing that if we calculated 2,300 days, actual literal days, there's no way that we would find ourselves fulfilling any of the prophecy. It would throw the entire book of Daniel off. And so we have no choice but to look at the 2,300 days as 2,300 years. So when you're in Daniel 9, 24, God says 77s, 490 days is cut off from the 2,300 days. Better termed, 490 years are cut off from the 2,300 years. If you're following that so far, understanding the day year principle, do me a favor and put the number four up in the chat. If you're following that, just put a number four up. The days represent years when we're dealing with this prophecy of the 2300 days. Go ahead and put a number four up, please. I just want to make sure that we're all following. Good. I'm seeing some fours. Need to see more fours so I can and make sure we're following. Dwayne? Yes, sir. Um, just, just to... Just to um, simplify even more if sure. the 2300 days is years and the 70 weeks is part of the 2300 days the 70 weeks must also be years that's right has to be any prop it has to be because it's only listen i'm, I'm gonna just say this real quick in the book of daniel there is only one prophecy there is only one time prophecy it is a 2300 days the 70 weeks, the 1260, the 1290, the 1335, all of those are different sections of the one prophecy, which is 2300 days. So if the 2300 days is a day for a year, then everything else in it is a day for a year. This, this translates over to the book of Revelation. When you look at the time prophecy in the book of Revelation, they're all part of this 2300 day prophecy, which means yep. It's all a day for a year. Why? Because it's really just one prophecy. All right. Excellent. So let's go ahead and let's go back to the slides. Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So again, as you can see, there are times that the days can represent years. As you can clearly see, Numbers 14, we just used that. Ezekiel 4, verse 6, you see that again. I have appointed thee each day for a year. One prophetic day can equal one literal year. So as we're going through Daniel 9, hopefully it's clear right now, we are talking 490 years that God wants to see these things take place. Now what we need to do is we need to find out the starting point. This is where we go to Daniel 9, 25. So if you got your Bibles, turn back to Daniel 9 and look at verse 25. In Daniel 9 and verse 25 now, now we're looking at when does this prophecy begin? And thank the Lord. The Bible spells it out really nice. Daniel hey, that, 9. I, um, Dwayne, Dwayne. Yeah, man. Yeah. <clears throat> Can we just test them real quick? Sure. I love pop quizzes. <laughs> I just, we just want to find out, can you tell us in which kingdom would this prophecy begin? If it's connected to Daniel chapter 8, there must be a kingdom one of these four kingdoms that this prophecy, you begin counting the 2300 days. You begin counting this 490, which is the beginning part of the 2300. So what kingdom would we be looking for, for this prophecy to begin? Could you put Ray K's uh, answer up there? <laughs> Medo-Persia. Yep. A and we know that because in Daniel 8, the kingdom that begins this vision is the Ram. That's right. The Medo-Persian Empire. That's so right. we know that this decree must begin sometime in the Medo-Persian Empire and extend to a certain period of time. So go ahead, Dwayne. Amen. And you know what? I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to give you, you know, some beautiful uh, Bible evidence here. So that way, you know, you always will see that everything that we're talking about, these are so not our ideas. These are so not our conjuring up. These are just results of faithfully studying the word of God. So I'm going to just go ahead and show it to you right here. 
that's not the one. Let me hold on one second. Make sure I got it right. Yeah, I pulled up the wrong one. Here we go. Okay, so, yep, there it is. All right, so again, in Daniel 9 and verse 25, there's, there's something very interesting that's stated. It says in Daniel 9, 25, because while it is true that we need to consider the kingdom, the timing with it, I want you to see how detail oriented God is. It's not merely the right kingdom, but it has to be the right timing within the kingdom. So I want you to watch this. In Daniel 9 and verse 25, it says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to do two things, <clears throat> to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. All right. So again, Daniel 9, 25, what event and date were to mark the starting point for the 490 year prophecy? The answer in Daniel 9, 25 is the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, if you carefully were to study all of these verses put up, I'm not going to go through all of them with you, but you're getting the slides. There are three characters that are mentioned within these chapters or with, yes, within these chapters, three characters, one, Cyrus, two, Darius, three, Artaxerxes. They all gave degrees of commands to Israel to begin to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. But I want us to go to the book of Ezra chapter seven. Let's look at that verse, Ezra chapter seven. This is during the time of King Artaxerxes, Ezra chapter seven. And when we go there, we're going to see something about Ezra that is different from Cyrus and Darius. So as we look at Ezra chapter seven, I want you to look at verse 21 to 28. It's really powerful. Ezra chapter seven, 21 through 28. And it says, and I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. Imagine you're a slave and imagine you are longing to see the beloved country you are from to be rebuilt and restored. And then one day the king, the ruler of the world comes to you and say, listen, and he says in your, in your presence, I'm telling all my servants and everybody else, whatever Dwayne asks for, don't just give it to him, give it to him quick. So I just want you to imagine, this is, this is literally what Artaxerxes is saying. Then he says, unto a hundred talents of silver, hundred measures of wheat, hundred ba baths of wine, etc. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, we're in verse 23, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Verse 24, also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. This is like a back in the days 501c3. You know what I'm saying? It's like they're not being taxed, tax deduction, everything. He's like, I don't want them to get taxed or anything. Then he says in verse 25, and thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God, that is thy God, set magistrates, wait a minute, He's even allowing him to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the point, go ahead and set up magistrates, set up judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. We're staying out of it. Y'all go ahead and do this, okay? And then, of course, verses 26 through 28. My point is very simple. Artaxerxes, you see no such autonomy given to the people of God to restore and rebuild Jerusalem according to God's order, not in Cyrus, not in Darius. It was only in the time of Artaxerxes the king. And the reason why this is important is because remember, it was at the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem that we start the timeline. This is where we start the countdown and it gets very exciting. 
The starting event was a decree from the Persian king, Artaxerxes, authorizing God's people who were captive in Medo-Persia to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. The decree found in Ezra chapter 7 was issued in 457 BC, the seventh year of the king, and was implemented in the autumn. Artaxerxes began his reign in 464. And you know what's so sweet about this? This is a biblical deduction, right? We are going through the Bible and then we're charting it through history. But here's the historical account. Artaxerxes, whose rule is through truth, was the fifth king of kings of Persia from 464 BC to 424 BC. He was the son of Xerxes I of Persia and a mistress, daughter of Otenes. Notice, these are literally the references of where we get this from, secular references. 457 BC, Artaxerxes decrees that the city government of Jerusalem be reestablished. So we have the word of God and we have faithful account of history. And this is part of that practice of something Pastor Ivor mentioned earlier, which is historicism and looking back in history and establishing the truth and the facts on the word of God. And what you're seeing, it was in 457 BC that we begin the countdown of the 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is getting very exciting, and I thank God for it. Before I continue, any thoughts or anything else that y'all want to jump in before I start going any further? We're just really breaking this thing down. I'm just going to add here, and I Go hope ahead. that you guys are seeing this, that we are presenting Daniel as an entire unit. That is a very difficult task to do if you're not presenting truth, because mm. error does not usually present itself as an entire cohesive unit, right? Error, you're not going to be able to make stuff match up. It's going to be off here and there. Yep. We didn't just jump into Daniel 8 and say, this is the meaning of it. We have built step by step, right, to show you this is how we get to Daniel 8. And now that we're in Daniel 8, we're going to show you how it's connected to Daniel 9, why it is a day for year, why out of the four different decrees, um, we choose a decree not in 538, not in 444, uh, not in 4, forget 414 or whatever the other one is, but in 457 BC. Why are we choosing that decree? And once we've chosen this decree, does the math line up? Right? There are too many different avenues that you can check this work for it to be error. That's right. And that's what, that's what we really hope that you are catching tonight is that the reason we're moving methodically through this is to show you, you cannot do this with error. Error does not make sense. Truth yep. is always going to harmonize and add up. Beautiful, beautiful, amen. So I want y'all to watch this. Sister Neffa, did you have any point before I continue? All right. So I want y'all to watch this now because, you know, we, we're unfolding some beautiful po points to this study. So, again, we're looking at this point that we see the 457 B.C. time frame. This is when the prophecy gets started. And, you know, it's funny because when you when you start to study the book of Daniel, if you really look at the three major religions of the world, Islam, Judaism and Christianity, you will find that one thing we all have in common is we have a great respect for the Old Testament. But it was interesting because when you begin to search the major religions of the world, like Islam and Judaism, if you go to Islam and you say, hey, what are you guys views on the prophet Daniel? These are the kind of things that they'll say. They say Daniel is usually considered by Muslims to have been a prophet. So they do acknowledge Daniel as a prophet, although he's not mentioned in the Quran. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but Daniel's not brought up in the Quran. It says there are a few hadith and Muslim records which bear his name and which refer to him, uh, you know, as far as being in the lion's den. But they, they don't give a great emphasis to the book of Daniel. That's why I love studying with my Muslim brothers and sisters. And I often like to talk to them from the prophecies of Daniel because he is a prophet that is respected. And then if you can walk them through the prophecy, it shows the Messiah and so on. And it makes it very beautiful when it comes to Judaism. You know, again, 
when it comes to the book of Daniel, here's, here's the Judaism's view on the prophet Daniel. A book of the Torah, this is what the Ju Judaism teaches about the, uh, the book of Daniel. It is a book of the Torah or the writer of that book. The book is included in the writings, but not the prophets, because by definition, prophecies are meant to be proclaimed and his visions were meant to be written, not proclaimed. So they have a very interesting view. Now, I'm going to let you in on a true story. One day I was talking with a sister many, many years. This is over 20 years ago. And I was working at a place, um, you know, and she was Jewish and she knew I was a Christian. So, we, you know, we talked about it. And I started sharing prophecy with her and she loved it. And I started to ask her, why is it? Because I don't know if you all saw, if you paid attention to what we read in Daniel 9 of how the Bible literally prophesied when the Messiah was going to come and be anointed. And in Judaism, the coming and anointing of the Messiah is everything. It's everything. So I'm going over this with her like, did you know Daniel 9 actually talks about it? So as I walked with her through this, you know, I'll back out of the screen real quick. I want to tell you all this. Literally, as I walked her through this, I was like, sis, do you know about Daniel 9? Nope, I don't know about it. So we started to walk her through it. I started to walk her through it. And she said, Dwayne, I've never heard this before in my life. This is so powerful. I'm going to share this with my rabbi. And I said, really? You're going to share with your rabbi? And I said, wonderful. Please do. And she said, yeah, yeah, I can't wait. I'll tell you how it goes. I'm going to the synagogue tonight. So true story. She goes to see her rabbi. She comes back later on. And when she comes back, she ends up, you know, I see her the next day. I'm like, hey, sis, how you doing? And she was just like, hi. And then she just starts walking away. And I was like, eh, that's strange. And I was just like, um, you know, hey, how you doing? You know, I'm, I'm trying to be all friendly with her. And she's like, hi. You know, and she's just moving real quick. It's like she doesn't want to talk to me. She's avoiding me. And then when I finally got her attention, I said, sis, what's going on? I said, how'd the study go with your rabbi last night? And she said, my rabbi told me, do not discuss any further this subject with you. And I said, really? I said, did he tell you why? He said, she said, because I would be in danger of receiving a curse from God. And I said, where did you get that from? And guess what? I found out where she got it from. I'm gonna show it to you right here. This is where she got it from. She said, don't do that. No, I can't do that. You know, because, you know, I'll fall under the, the curse of God, etc. And here's what we found right here. This is what's called the Talmud. And this is what is written in the Talmudic anthology. May the curse of heaven fall upon those who calculate the date of the advent of the Messiah and thus create political and social unrest among the people. This was a commentary relating to Daniel chapter nine. For many reasons, Satan hates the book of Daniel. For many reasons, Satan hates the book of Revelation. And we should not be surprised of why we see so much confusion in our world, in the world of religion, even in the world of Christianity, because it, the devil will do anything to make sure we do not properly understand the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Why? Because it points us so clearly to the Messiah. It points us so clearly to the sanctuary. It points us so clearly to the victories of the power of sin over our lives through the indwelling Christ. No wonder the devil doesn't want us to understand this. And so this is the reason why we have to go through this very prayerfully and very, very carefully. And so thus far, we see 457 BC, that marks the timeline. Now, I think we're going to cover one more part for tonight. We'll probably have to push it off, push the rest off till the next week because I do not want to rush through this. I, I think that we're being fed well. And you know what happens when you eat too fast? You start burping, passing gas, and getting all sorts of toxicity inside of you and everything else because you're not digesting your food good. So I am not here to overfeed you too fast. We're going to let you take it bite size. Marinate on it, chew your food so it can properly digest and give your body what it needs so you can be strong for the Lord. So we'll just give you a little bit more. And then after that, we'll just stop. We'll continue it next week and break it down because the Lord is making some very important points clear and the truth is being told and truth makes people free. So the angel said 69 
prophetic weeks or 483 literal years was to be added to that 457 BC, which would reach to the Messiah. That's why our dear brothers and sisters in Judaism are like, look, don't study that book of Daniel because it's even deeper than Isaiah 53. While Isaiah 53 defines the character of the Messiah beautifully, what Daniel 9 does is it marks the timeline of the anointing of the Messiah. And that is something that anyone who is opposed to the truth about Jesus is going to truly hate. And so here it is that it makes it very clear. After 69 prophetic weeks, 483 literal years, then we're going to take that out of that 457. Remember, BC era, you count backwards. Okay, you don't do like how we do today in AD where you count forward. We count backwards. So you go 457, 456, 455, 454, and backwards. All right. So the question is this. The angel said that 69 prophetic weeks or 483 literal years were going to be added to the 457 BC and would reach to the Messiah. And the question is, did that really happen as we start this deduction? If you were to calculate, mathematical calculations show that moving ahead 483 full years from the fall of 457 BC, it actually reaches the fall of AD 27. All right. This part is just simple math. But watch this. It goes deeper. Remember, the Bible said something about Jesus. And it says something very interesting. When God was making clear to Mary that she was going to, you know, when Mary was going to, uh, you know, have the baby, Jesus, the Bible referred to Jesus as that holy thing. So I decided to look up the word holy and I couldn't find anything on it in, in the Greek. But I did look up the word thing, and I thought the word thing was very interesting. Here's what the word thing meant. As you can see, and, and even the Greek word for thing I found to be very interesting because anybody who knows Greek and knows the sanctuary would find it very interesting that the Greek word for the most holy thing is hagios because that's the same Greek word minus the S putting in an N for the sanctuary, which is Hagion. And here it is that Jesus is referred to as a most holy one or the most holy thing. Jesus, he's referred to as a most holy one or a most holy thing. Are you following that? And so here it is that the Bible's clear that this is talking about Jesus. Jesus is considered when Jesus came into this world and then this happened. You'll remember that the word Messiah means anointed. It's right there in your margins in John chapter one and verse 41. And Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost, Acts 10, 38, at his baptism. You remember when Christ was baptized, that's when the spirit of God came down like a dove from heaven. And the voice of God from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It was at that point that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power. And so here it is that when we think about Jesus in his ministry, now this is, this is a part that I'm gonna take a second to go ahead and break this down a little bit. You'll remember that David, King David, you remember that when he went through, he went through three anointings, right? David was anointed prophet, David was anointed priest, and David was anointed king, okay? Jesus is the son of David. And so this anointing carries through at different phases in the ministry of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on this earth, he was anointed and he was anointed as prophet. But when Jesus ascended into heaven, he was anointed our priest. And the Bible makes it very clear that when he comes back, he's going to be our king as well. And so when we look at Jesus we can see that the anointing work began. The anointing work began at that baptism, but Jesus continued to move from different phases of his ministry and was anointed into the next point of ministry and then ultimately to the final point of ministry. And so when we see this, there is no way. And the, the, the interesting thing about this, going back to the slides now, watch this, going back to the slides, look at this point right here, talking about our beloved savior. Look at what it says. Uh-huh. So it shows this. Again, 
Jesus, that most holy one, that most holy thing. He is the Messiah. He is anointed. And then his anointing took place in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, the reason why this is so important, because once again, we can go back to history. Jesus was anointed. Don't lose this. Jesus, that most holy one, was anointed right at the time of the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, according to Luke 3 and verse 1. And so the question is, what year was it during the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar? Watch this. When we look at Tiberius Caesar, let's go ahead and let's do some history. This is a beautiful statement. I have all six volumes of this book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. These are excellent sources that you and I can own and we can study them. You can actually download them on your eBooks if you have like iPad, Kindle or anything like that. But look at this. The historian Gibbon explains that prior to his death, Augustus dictated a law by which the future prince, Tiberius, was invested with an authority equal to his own over the provinces and the armies. So please notice that. Augustus, before his death, notice it, because normally you would wait for one leader to die and then the other one would just step in in authority. Not so here. It says prior to Augustus's death, he dictated a law by which the future Prince Tiberius was invested with an authority equal to his own over the provinces and the armies. Continuing. In the provinces, Tiberius had equal standing and authority with Caesar Augustus. But it is worth pointing out, I think, that even while Augustus was still alive and technically holding superiority in Rome, all Rome, which hated Tiberius for his stern Puritanism, resigned itself to the fact that though Augustus was still prince, a living emperor, Tiberius had begun to rule. Very important. Watch this. Judea was one of the Roman provinces in which Tiberius's authority was equal to Caesar, Augustus's. And of course, it was in Judea that Luke wrote his account dating the baptism of Jesus in the 15th year of Tiberius. Watch this. Another relevant point is that Augustus's health had been failing for some years and he was an invalid at 60. Augustus made Tiberius his co-regent and in Judea, the reign of Tiberius was dated. Here we go. We're looking for the date. Not from the death of Augustus, as would normally have been the case, but from that time to years prior to the death of Augustus, which was A.D. 12, when Tiberius was given legal equality with Augustus. Legally and for all practical purposes, Tiberius was emperor over the province of Judea, even while Augustus was still living. And notice that when you do the count 15 years from that time, it matches A.D. 27. There are, and the reason I took the time to put this here for you, and I can't wait for you all to have these slides, is because there are some people that will say, oh, no, 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 no. I see Jesus as A.D. 29. And it's like, no, it's not AD 29, because that, that's calculating from the time Augustus died. But no, you don't want to do that. You calculate from the time Augustus gave Tiberius authority to reign equal to him, which was two years prior, which lands not on AD 29, but exactly on AD 27. Always remember the zero year principle. You don't go five, four, three, two, one, zero one, two, three, four, five. That's not how you calculate. When you're calculating from BC to AD, you simply go five, four, three, two, one, and then one, two, three, four, five. There's no zero. And so as long as you do your calculations from 457 BC backwards, 483 years, you're going to land on AD 27. And so praise God, Jesus was baptized, anointed, he was the anointed Messiah in A.D. 27. And this is why we can truly say we know that we have an absolute sure word of prophecy. I mean, like, seriously, we have a sure word of prophecy. And what's so encouraging to me about this 
is if God was so on point, so on target and so right with everything else that he said, is he not worthy of our trust when he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world? Isn't he worthy of our trust when he says, I am the resurrection and the life? Isn't he worthy of our trust when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you? I mean, God is trying to say, if my words are so on point as I'm walking through dates, I'm naming kings and I'm walking through all these timelines and God is like, and I'm on point, I, I'm on target. I'm exact to the date. Why would we think that God is just abstract towards us and his love towards us? Why would we think that God is just, you know, <laughs> suddenly so so careless and and just you know, aloof to our problems and so on. When he's also said through the same inspired word, I'm with you. I will be with you. I will not leave you alone. I will help you. This is the beauty of studying Bible prophecy. If God is so on point with dates and times and all these other things, that means he's also on point with every promise that he's made to you and made to me. And that's what I take from Bible prophecy. I, I'm not just excited about calculating the dates and watching the movements of different things. That's powerful too. But what's more powerful to me is, man, Lord, if, if you if you are this, if your word is your bond like this, wow, then that, that means every promise that you've made for me, I could take it to the bank. And this is why Christians should not worry. This is why Christians, true believers in God, it, it doesn't make sense for us to fall into worry, except it be that the devil has somehow gotten us to forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. And that's why we go through these prophecies, to encourage your faith, to build you up and to let you know God is still worthy of your praise and your trust, because we are watching God really on target. So I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to leave it right here where we, we, we've gotten into the Messiah, you know. And, and we, we're almost through this 490 years because we're already at 483 and we're already up to the anointing of the Messiah. So all we got is seven more years left. And I, I quite honestly, I can't wait to hit it because when we get into the, to, to the seven years, the evangelical world has put that seven years way out in the future, even past 2021. Oh, by the way, happy new year. I don't think I said that to everybody, but yeah, happy new year. Praise God. We made it. But, you know, again, it's like there, there are people who put this seven year tribulation, they put it way on the future. We're going to absolutely crush that argument. I mean, we're going to show clear as day from the word of God. There is no way you could take those last seven years from the anointing of the Messiah and put it way out in the future. No way. That's impossible. So we're going to make all of these things plain when we come back by the grace of God next week. But that's all I wanted to share on this right now. We are going through the 2300 year prophecy and we've already covered 483 years of the 2300 years. When we come back, we're going to cover that other seven years that brings us right to the 490 because there's some deep stuff that happened. And then after that, we're going to start bridging into the remaining years. And ultimately, where do we land when we find ourselves concluding the 2300 years, and I can't wait to go over it. So that's a little bit that I wanted to share, and I hope that you're blessed by it. I hope that you've been encouraged by it. And uh, gang, I don't know if you got some more comments or things that you want to go ahead and share, but I'm going to pause right here because I'm watching our time, and I don't want to overwhelm the saints. Um, were you going to add something, sister? Yeah, let me... I want to see if I can just tie something in very quickly, kind of tie up a what some might think is a loose end. Um, and very simple point. Um, the 70 weeks is a small scale version of what happens in the larger 2300 day prophecy. Okay, so 2300 day prophecy is one prophecy. The 70 weeks or 490 years is the first part of that prophecy, but the events of the first part of that prophecy will parallel events in the larger 2300 day prophecy. And I'll just share this one thing. When does the, the decree begin? It begins with the rebuilding of the city and the temple. So remember this, the children of Israel have spent some time in Babylonian captivity. 
And then all of a sudden, they are set free. They come out of Babylon to begin the work of rebuilding the city and the temple. We're going to find that parallel with this 2300 day prophecy. In other words, what we're gonna find is that God's end time people will come out of something called spiritual Babylon to begin this emphasis on rebuilding a spiritual city, Jerusalem, and, and this spirit, the significance of a heavenly temple. So just keep that in mind because you may be wondering, what does the 70 weeks have to do with 2300 days? They parallel in many ways. One is the smaller scale. The other is the larger and heavenly scale. And, and that's all I'll share on that. Amen. Amen. Sister Nefer, is there anything that you wanted to share, sister? Um, so no, not really. I don't have anything to add except just to share my excitement. <laughs> As usual, I just get really excited when we speak on these things. Um, you know, there's definitely something that gives us comfort and reassures us. Uh, I saw a lot of comments, people saying things like um, the, the prophecy is sure. Right. Also, I want to encourage you guys to go ahead and start submitting your questions. We're going to take a few of them before we go. Yeah. Um, so please, so yeah, so please start um, submitting your questions. But the prophecy is sure. That's there's just it's again. This is something that we've said before, and I'm I know for a fact I said last week. But there are just too many focal points for there to be for this to be a coincidence. Um, it just, it just harmonizes so beautifully. And it's kind of like, <laughs> it's it, the analogy that comes to mind. There was a meme that was shared about atheism. There are two snowmen talking to each other. Um, they're snowmen. And one says, oh, we just were created by happen chance of snowflakes <laughs> forming together. And the ridiculousness of that argument, right? Um, and I'm thinking of these things, the, the prophecies in that same vein, how they line up with history. There's no way that this could just be snowflakes falling together and creating a snowman. Um, the Lord was, very, like you said, very precise in putting this together. He encourages, encourages us by saying he has told us beforehand so that when it comes to pass, well, no, we know what time it is. We know what time it is. And I praise God for it. I praise God for the opportunity to both learn and share these things. Um, because again, these were written thousands, <laughs> hundreds of years ago, but with the specific intent in mind that we who live in these days would study them. So God is good. Um, uh, brothers, I hope you're looking through the, the comments to see any questions you might want to answer. We'll take a few questions before we go. Um, again, the link has been put in the chat a few times to register for our private group study. Um, and that same link I'm learning can be used to get the slides. So y'all don't have to email me. Go ahead and click that link uh, to get the slides from the presentations. All right. Okay, so if there, if there are any questions, then let's go ahead and let's take some of those questions. I know that one person asked, is there anything that they should read between now and next week? I would definitely say go through the entire book of Daniel 9. Definitely go through all of Daniel 9. Uh, that's going to be very, very important. And the slides that I put up, I'll make sure that they're available um, shortly after this, and I'll send it over to Sister Nefer so we can have it all uploaded for you all. Uh, Elizabeth, we're going to address the, the daily sacrifice next week. Um, <clears throat> We have, we have really put a lot into this presentation and I, I'll tell you, we can, we can spend weeks just on Daniel 9, just on the 70 week prophecy because it is rich with, with it's just a rich prophecy. It is. Um, and it is, it is the crucial prophecy that, that connects the old covenant with the new covenant. Um, there are a lot of Hebrew Israelites that do not understand this prophecy. Yep. And as a result of it, the, their theology, um, it, it, it's just so much. This prophecy is crucial. So we're going to answer these questions 
uh, you know, if we answer this question, we will get back into <laughs> another aspect of Daniel 9 that we, we didn't, we'll get into an aspect of Daniel 9 that we didn't touch on tonight. So hold on for that, for that answer. Okay. We're, we're going to be touching on that. Um, oh, so we get this question often. It's not necessarily about the study, but it's about the link. You do not have to have a Facebook account in order to join the private studies or to get the slides. Once you put your information in, we have your information. The next um, page is if you wanted to join our Facebook group. But by the time you've gotten to that point, we already um, have recorded your information so that you can get access to both the private studies as well as the um, slides. So don't worry about that. Um, Ruben, very quickly, um, that is accurate. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter two that these kingdoms will try to cleave one to another, but that they will not mix, right? Just as iron and clay doesn't mix, God's people should not be mixing with the world in the way that what you have happening is this description of church and state. That's what you have happening, rising out of the Roman Empire. And Really, that's the model that we have many Christians trying to return to in the United States of America. They were never meant to mingle, right? Um, the church should not be using state power or legislation to try to enforce righteousness. And this is where all these prophecies are heading to, because that's what the Bible is telling us will happen at the end of time. So uh, that is not incorrect, uh, but what we share tonight was an amplification of that, right? This is the this is church and state that is joining together, but they were never meant to mingle. When they mingle, the end result is persecution. And another thing to consider too is that in God's mind, you know, there's a way that you could study the Bible called the law of first mention. So sometimes the first time something is mentioned in scripture and the inherent meaning of that mentioning that first time can carry over as you go throughout scripture. The first time the word cleave comes up in the Bible is in Genesis chapter two, where it talks about the husband and the wife and that they would cleave together and no man would put asunder. Originally, marriage was gonna be something that was just gonna last without ending. And that is part of the idea of cleaving. God makes it very clear that though there's going to be kingdoms that are going to try, like Babylon of old, they're going to try to exalt themselves and live forever and reign forever and so on. God makes it very clear that's not going to happen. God makes it very clear a time is going to come where even as they're trying to cleave together and establish this church state environment that's going to last for however long they think, God says, nope, I'm going to come and I'm going to crush it. I'm going to crush all of it. I'm going to hit him right at the feet. Yeah. And I'm going to knock it out. Yeah, yeah. Ivor. Yeah. I don't want to open you know, a whole new discussion. But when you, the reason that God destroyed the world in the flood was when the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Mm -hmm. This is not talking about, you know, uh, angels having uh, interaction with human beings. This is talking about the lineage, those who claim to be the lineage of God, right? Sons of God uh, were mingling with the world. We're mingling with unbelievers. The Bible says, you know, not to be unequally yoked. And it was this mingling of the sons of God with the daughters of men that basically just wiped out uh, godliness in those days. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing that is happening with the toes of iron and clay. This mingling of those who profess to be serving God with those who do not. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the result is those who serve God compromise. Yep. Yep. And so that's, again, the issue there with the cleaving um, to Mario's question. Some people like to say a day to God is like a thousand years when you try to explain the twenty three hundred day prophecy. You know, it's, it's as different as night is from day. Um, God is not governed by time. He is eternal. He's the beginning and he's the end. He is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He's all knowing. He's everywhere. And you, you, he's all powerful. Nothing can throw him off guard. So when God created time, when God slotted times out, he gave that for our benefit. You read that in Genesis one, it was right in the creation story in verses 16 through 18, that when God created the sun, the moon, the stars, etc., he said, he gave that to mankind to help govern time and seasons and all these different things. So yeah, 
a day with God is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. That's speaking to God's omniscience. God, God knows everything. There's, there's no timeline with God, but there is timeline with us. There is timeline with us as his people. And so the 2300 days prophecy or the 2300 year prophecy is very much a real timeline that God is trying to say to all of us, we need to calculate it and pay attention to it because as we're learning in our study, there's some powerful truths we're learning as we're watching God's timeline, you know, as he's walking us through these things. So you got to know what 2 Peter 3, 8 is saying versus what 2 Peter 3, 8 is not saying. So when Peter's talking about that, he's just making it very clear. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. A thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but he's just long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but no. that all should come to repentance. So Peter's just simply marking the point that, you know, a day, a thousand years, they're all equal to him. And the reason he allows time to persist is because he's long suffering and he's really trying to give mankind every opportunity not to be lost. But it has, it has nothing to do with prophetic timelines because Jesus prioritized timelines. Three days, I'll come back up again. He meant it. It wasn't 3000 years, you know. So you, you got many areas in the Bible where God draws that line, his understanding of how he views time, but then prophetic timelines that he wants us to pay attention to. Hopefully that kind of addresses that question. Were there any other questions that you all saw? I see one here. Humble's asking, how do we get 2300 years? Um, I don't know if you were in on the earlier part of the study, but. Um, in Daniel chapter eight, the question is asked, how long um, shall be the vision concerning the daily and the abomination of desolation to give the host uh, to be trodden underfoot? This question is regarding the entire vision of Daniel eight. The vision begins with the Medo-Persian empire and ends with this kingdom that rises after Rome. So these 2300 day, this 2300 day period, symbolically, it, this 2300 day period must cover Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and this kingdom that rises after Rome. Thus the 2300 days cannot be literal days. They must be a day for a year. And that is verified when we go to Daniel chapter nine, and see that the 70 weeks are based on the same pattern. So when it says 70 weeks to the coming of the Messiah, if you count 70 literal weeks, you're still in the Medo-Persian empire. That's 490 literal days. When you go 490 years, it brings you down to the time of the Messiah and everything that he would accomplish in that time period. Yeah. Yeah, so and so th that, is, that is how we get, and listen guys, we don't have to even appeal to Numbers 1434 and you know, Ezekiel 4.6 and say a day equal. Just the fact that this 2300 day period must cover Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the kingdom after Rome, you know it's gotta be 2300 years. It cannot be 2300 days. Yep, yep. Um, I like this question, be kind. Hi brethren, is there any other time prophecy after Daniel 8.14? Pastor Ivor kind of alluded to this point earlier in the study that the other prophetic timelines, um, you know, they, they mix. The other prophetic timelines fall within the 2300 years. So, you know, in the book of Daniel, you got 2300 years, right? The, within that, you have 490. You have the 1260 times times dividing of times. We went over that a few weeks back. You got something called a 1290 in Daniel 12. You have a 1335, that's in Daniel 12. All of those prophetic timelines fit within the 2300 years. Once and, we and Duane, let, yeah, man. let's just add, let's add the you know the 42 months in Revelation 13, yeah. um, uh, Revelation 12, Revelation 13. Yet all the timeline, all these time prophecies, they are they are various angles of the same prophecy. Exactly. You know, and so they all are within that 2300 years. So once we get to the end of that 2300 years, listen carefully to what I say, please. 
once we get to the end of the 2300 years, there's no more prophecies based on time. No more prophecies based on time. Once you get to the end of that 2300 year prophecy, the only other prophecies to be fulfilled are what we call event based prophecies, events, things that's going to happen. OK, but it's not going to be actual timelines, 1200 years, 300 years, two years, five years, 10 years. None of that. Once that 2300 years hits, that's the end of it. There's nothing else after that. Everything else to be fulfilled is going to be events. Like when Jesus would say in Matthew 24, there shall be famines, there shall be pestilences, nation shall rise against nation. Those are all events. So those things are still going to happen. The mark of the beast, the image of the beast. OK, uh, time of Jacob's trouble, all of those things. Those are events, but there's no more time prophecies after the 2300 years. So when you ask that question, hi, brethren, is there any other time prophecy? I'm answering that in a very, very succinct manner. No more time prophecies after the, the 2300 years, but there will be event based prophecies after the 2300 years. Hope that's clear. So. Um... Ryan, and this I think this will be the last question that I'm going to take, but uh, yeah. Ryan was asking um, uh, to clarify about the little horn coming from the four winds and not from the horns. So when you read Daniel chapter, chapter 8 uh, and verse uh, 9, somewhere around there, when it says uh, the four horns rose out of the, uh, the he-goat and it spread toward the four winds of heaven. And then the very next word is out of one of them. So what was the last thing that was mentioned? The four horns or the four winds? The four winds out of one of them. Why is that significant? The four winds are north, south, east, and west. North, south, east, and west. And we know that when these, when, when Greece had broken up into these four divisions, the Bible is introducing something that's going to be relevant for us when we get to Daniel chapter 11. Because in Daniel chapter 11, you have this introduction of these phrases, the king of the north and the king of the south. There are these two entities that are fighting back and forth. One is from the north, one is from the south. You're going to see that, in fact, in Daniel 8, this little horn, it says it is, it is, it moves towards the south. So we know it's not coming from the south. And it moves towards the east and towards the pleasant land. When we get to Daniel 11, you see the king, this power called the king of the north, is described exactly as this little horn of Daniel chapter eight and Daniel chapter seven. So understanding that helps you when we get when we get to Daniel 11 to see, oh, this is the king of the north being spoken about. Why is the king of the north significant? The king of the north is significant because remember this little horn power is ultimately the antichrist. Do you remember where the Bible says Satan wanted to sit in heaven? Isaiah chapter 14, when he says, I will be like the most high. What did he say? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. The sides of the north. That is a position Satan wanted to occupy because he wanted to be like God. This antichrist power in Daniel chapter seven and Daniel chapter eight is beginning to be identified as this power from the north. And remember, it is the north where Satan himself wanted to, wanted to pretend that he was God. But this is taking us into Daniel chapter 11, which at this point in time is really not the, the focus, like I said, at this point in time, but this is why it is significant that you have God introducing these four winds, the four directions of heaven for the first time in the book of Daniel. Yep. 
Uh, and by process of elimination, we know he's not coming from the South. We know he's not coming from the East. So we're left with, is he coming from the West or the North? Further chapters will clarify that for us. This is the King of the North. Man. Um, thank you. Thank you, brothers. That's all the time we have for this evening. Um, I'm going to hand the floor over to Brother Lemon to close us out with a word of prayer. We've put the link in the chat a few times if you guys want to join us for private study. Um, you can also get the slides by clicking that link. We will be here next week by, by God's grace. Um, the studies that we have here are Tuesday nights, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Um, Eastern time. Amen. All right. Amen. And I want to thank God uh, for all of us being able to go through these studies. And my hope and my prayer is that you're willing to take heed to what the word of God is saying. And, you know, look forward to the blessings, family, because there's tons of them that await us. So next week, by God's grace, we'll go back into it again. And we'll look forward to seeing you then. Let's have a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we are very grateful, Lord, for the blessing of being able to study, to show ourselves approved unto you that we can be workmen that need not be ashamed, for we have rightly divided your words of truth. We thank you for the work women as well. And we pray, dear God, that you will help all of us to be found faithful at last. Your words have once again proven themselves to be sure. It is so refreshing to review these prophecies and to see how accurate you are. And therefore we can trust that every promise you have made to us, your people is also accurate, that we can bank on it, Lord. And we can truly trust you even in the most trying times. Keep us faithful, we pray. Keep us strong and healthy. Thank you again, Lord, for this first meeting of the new year. Bring us safely through until next week where we will come back and feast again on thy words. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. God bless. Good night, guys. Hopefully we'll see you next week and bring a friend next time. Amen.